back to the Queen City Guitar Shop. Um, so one of the first videos that I uploaded to this YouTube channel dealt with the method that I used to hold down boards, um, sides, backs, tops, any thin piece of wood uh, that I can't just use bench dogs to hold down while I thickness. In that video, I mostly just focused on that method. Um, but I didn't go into the real nuts and bolts of thicknessing. And recently, somebody left me a comment on that video asking about specifically thicknessing harder woods. Um, they referenced curly maple, but I thought that this guitar that I'm currently building is an Indian rosewood back and sides, and it would be perfect to make a video for, for that and to focus on the actual thicknessing and not just on how I hold the, the plates down. Um, now, they specifically wanted to know about curly maple, um, but I think most of my recommendations that have to do with thicknessing kind of apply across the board. And rosewood is certainly not the easiest thing to thickness, um, just because it's so dense. So I think this will still work uh, and be very applicable for their question. This video also will be extra fun because this is actually only the second Indian rosewood guitar that I've ever built. Um, I tend to focus more on domestic woods or on mahogany and mahogany-like woods, um, sipo and sapele sorts of things. Um, and the first Indian rosewood guitar that I ever built was actually my very first guitar, which I built as a student and had a very different tool library at my disposal. Um, it was a, a mostly machine shop. We we used safety planners and um, thickness sanders and the only real hand tools that touched the backs and the sides of guitars were scrapers. Um, so this will be the first Indian Rosewood back that I have thicknessed using hand tools and using the process that I normally employ to work on guitars. Um, and so I kind of just jumped into this with no prior experience um, and looking at this as a fresh board which is pretty much how I look at every every board that is on my bench that I need to thickness. Um, there's so many differences between woods and between boards that you kind of just got to feel out what you can and can't get away with as you thickness anything. Um, so yeah, that was fun uh, and I have some footage of trying various planes and um, you know, going to be talking about advantages, disadvantages, because you have to balance both the safety of not creating a lot of tear out and the speed of being able to get a board down to the thickness without it taking the entire day. Um, specifically for thicknessing anything, um, but it, it comes into play when you get into more difficult woods, I have definitely a few recommendations if you're trying to do it with hand tools. The first one is definitely that all of your planes should be sharp. Um, if your scraper is not sharp, it's not probably going to damage the wood, it's just going to be a pain to deal with. But a dull plane is going to be much more likely to damage the board that you're working on. So if you have any doubts about the sharpness of a plane, um, it's best to just sharpen it before you start working or if you can get away with another plane that you know is sharp, uh, to not use the dull plane. Dull tools are always going to be more difficult to work with than sharp tools. Um, my other recommendation, my second recommendation, is that you have a sturdy workbench. Um, this bench is pretty sturdy and fairly heavy. Um, it's, it's solid, hard maple. It will still skate across my floor. You put in a lot of force when you're planing um, boards. You might, it might not feel like it, but you're putting in a lot of force. And if the bench isn't sturdy, it's going to skate around. It's going to make everything more difficult. Also, if the joinery isn't sturdy, it's going to rack from side to side. And that's going to make the whole process more difficult. Um, I actually, maybe a year and a half ago, went in and put a second cross member underneath this bench because it was moving around a little bit more than I liked. Um, 
and that was well worth the, the day I spent making that and joining it in to the underside of the bench. I know if I tried to use my plywood and 2x4 bench as I've tried before, it's, it's really not ideal. You could get away with a lot of things, but if at all possible, it's nice to have a sturdy bench. It's nice to do whatever work you can do to make the bench you have sturdier, even if it's not ideal. So my, my third and, and really final recommendation for um, thicknessing parts of a guitar, backs, tops, sides, whatever, is specific tools. I think it's super helpful to have uh, a plain iron that's toothed. Um, this is a Veritas number seven low angle plane. Um, they sell three different variety of tooth toothed irons for these. Um, you can also probably find them on eBay. Um, there's probably other makers currently. It's a little bit more difficult to find new ones. Um, but they're out there. You can find them. They're super useful. Uh, not as essential is a scraper plane. It's just a lot easier on your hands than using a card scraper for the whole process, um, which we'll get into later in the video. It's not, it's not essential. A card scraper also works well. Um, the scraper plane is just really nice. Um, and so the reason that the tooth plane is so essential has a lot to do with how um, the grain runs through a board, both like an ideal board and the actual boards that we're, we're using for guitars. So if you can imagine a tree as it grows. Um, we cut a board out of the tree, you know, and, and generally in the direction that the tree has been growing. Um, and if we look down, you know, at, from a top angle at that board, we can see grain lines running along here, uh, which I think is what we normally, what people tend to think of as um, the grain lines in the tree. And those basically correspond with the tree rings. Um, every year the tree puts on another layer. But each of those layers is basically composed of wood fibers that act as straws that draw moisture up into the tree. And they move in a direction that, that follows the growth of the tree. So in an ideal board that we cut from a, from a tree, from an ideal tree that has grown perfectly straight with no twist whatsoever, um, the faces of that board are either going to be cut or split so that they're perfectly in line um, and flat and, and perfectly parallel with the straws of the tree, um, the grain that's moving up, up with the wood. But in, in reality, you know, either the board is cut a little canted, the tree is twisted a little bit, um, any number of things, the, the tree kind of undulates a little as it moves. Um, any of these things can throw the grain off in relation to the actual flat planes that we want on the board. And so that can mean that instead of the, that grain being parallel with the faces that we are going to eventually have, that grain is, is moving diagonally. Um, it's, it's out of plane with those faces. So when we get to our actual piece of wood that we're trying to thickness, that inconsistency between um, how the tree has grown and the board that we're actually trying to, to make with, with two flat parallel sides can can make planing difficult. Um, and if you can imagine, right, assuming the grain lines are just ever so slightly diagonal with the face that I'm trying to make in a board, with, with what I've, what is, what is possible with that piece of wood. Um, so they, if they're canted up and I plane this direction, my plane is just going to cut those straws off and it's not going to be a problem. Um, and it's, it's going to plane fine. If I try and plane this direction, the plane is going to want to dig into that grain. Um, the, the iron, the blade, is going to want to slide into that grain. But then I'm still moving forward, 
And so it's, what it's going to do is it's going to tear out that grain and all the grain behind it, creating, creating tear out. Um, and if you're working with like a side, um, I mean, you don't want a lot of run out in a side anyway, but if you're working with a side or an unjoined top or an unjoined back or any piece of wood where there's just a single piece of wood and it's not complex, um, the grain's all basically running in the same direction, you can just plane in that one direction and it's not going to be a problem. Um, But let's say, for instance, the thing that gives wood figure is that the grain is undulating as it, as it moves through the board. And so you get peaks where you have grain going this direction, and then it curves down, and it's going the other direction. And so no matter which direction you plane, you're always going to be hitting grain that's going to want to tear out. So that could be a problem where there might not be any direction you can go on a, on a side without experiencing tear out with a regular plane. Um, but, but even if you have a very simple situation, on a back um, or a top where you have two pieces of wood that are book matched and joined together, uh, that little bit of run out, no matter like how consistent it is across the board and how simple it is, is still going to give you a problem. And the reason for that is if you imagine how a book match works, you have a board. Um, let's say the grain is running this direction. So you would ordinarily say, well, I can plane it this way, and it's not going to cause me any trouble. But when you book match it, you cut it in half, and you flip it over. And so the grain that was facing that direction is now facing that direction. And as you plane across it, it's good until you get to the join, and then you cross into the other piece, and all of a sudden you're tearing out on the other side. Um, so that can be a real challenge to work with with hand planes um, or say you have a piece of figured uh, curly maple where the grain is, is doing this um, and in order to make a flat surface you have to be able to cut grain that's moving in either orientation. Um, for that the tooth blade is super useful because the blade itself is broken up um, into discrete segments, and so they can cut through the wood without having anywhere near as much tendency to dig into that grain and tear it out. It's still possible to get tear out with a tooth plane, but it's a lot less likely, um, and you have to work a lot harder at it. Uh, practically, the best way to do it is to just like set the depth of cut too big so that you're bypassing the teeth and cutting more than the teeth would allow. But generally speaking, it's a super useful way to deal with almost any grain that you can come across. The main disadvantage to it, though, is that you got to go slow. You, you cut the furrows, they're not very deep, and then you have to go back and clean them up. Um, you, you don't have to, but it's faster if you cut a pass and then clean them up with something else like the scraper plane and then cut another pass so it's nice to be able to work down to that so i think at this point we'll just jump into my actual planing process uh, that i videoed earlier this back is already brought down all the way um, to a, a uniform thickness that's approximating the thickness i'd like it to be uh, when it actually goes on the guitar so i'm going to go i'm going to go through that footage and talk a little bit about, little bit about what I'm doing, um, talk about the planes I'm using, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of each, um, and sort of the process that I use when I'm thicknessing a back. It could be any back because you never know exactly how a piece of wood is going to behave until you're actually working it with the planes. Uh, so yeah, let's get to it. So this back came to me pretty thin, um, a lot thinner than I would personally want it, but it's still going to work fine. Um, it does mean that I'm not going to have a lot of material to work with to remove, uh, which is both a good and bad thing. Uh, it means I'm going to be more careful as I work it down to the final thickness and I run through various planes to talk about their different merits. Um, so I do a high glue rub joint on tops and backs and it's secured with just a little bit of tape. 
So the first step is to remove the tape and scrape down the glue squeeze out uh, on both sides. I don't care if it's completely level. Um, I just don't want any big ridges of glue to mess up um, the leveling action of the planes. And then once that's scraped down, I'm going to go ahead and pin this back into place and start thicknessing it. I am going to chamfer the edges of this back before I actually start thicknessing it. Um, that is going to reduce but not eliminate the possibility of splitting off uh, the edges of the board as I plane across the grain. And I'm going to want to be able to plane in multiple directions, including across the grain, while I bring this down to help uh, ensure that everything remains flat with the minimum amount of having to check all the time um, on the thickness. So normally I would start off with a jack plane and that's what I'm going to do here. Um, the blade on a jack plane is slightly curved and that is going to allow me to take a deeper cut than I could with a, a straight bladed plane with less chance of tear out, although I am going to still probably get tear out with the jack plane. Um, and as this is my first few passes over this board, I'm going to be paying particular attention, being extra careful, and being mindful of the fact that I can always back the blade off and take a smaller cut if I'm getting tear out. It can also be helpful if I'm moving in a line along a board, I want it back, um, and it's not working in one direction, it can be helpful to switch directions and sometimes that will result in a more satisfactory cut. Um, though you're still likely to get some tear out if you have a difficult top with a jack plane. Of course, you might not have a jack plane, and you might not have a plane that you feel willing to create an angled, uh, a curved iron for, because um, it doesn't need to be any special plane. Uh, the body at least. You can get away though with a, a regular smoothing plane, uh, though it's it's tricky and it's not going to work for everything. Um, sometimes angling the plane in relation to the direction you're trying to cut can work, creating more of like a shearing sort of action as opposed to just a, the entire length of a blade cutting. Uh, it can be quick and dirty, but it sometimes is effective to go in one direction until you hit the middle and you start and you start dragging and then to simply reverse direction, though it's risky and you're likely to mess it up and get some tear out, so I wouldn't advise trying to do it for your final few passes. Um, one of the most reliable ways that I've found to use a less than ideal plane to thickness is going to be working across the grain, um, but it's extra important to make sure you're not taking too big of a cut. Uh, because not only are you risking tear out and you're likely still to get some tear out with this method, but you're also risking splitting off uh, the far side of the board that you're working on, um, which, depending on how bad it splits, can be really, really bad. It's always a risk no matter what plane you're using. I'm using the tooth plane here, and it's evidenced by my disappointed look. I just split the side off. Now, because I don't have a lot of material to remove, and because on this first face I'm mostly interested in flattening things and not removing material, I'm going to switch to the tooth plane pretty quickly. Um, as you can see here, I'm taking a pretty aggressive cut, and that is going to directly lead to that edge break that we just saw, but I'm not getting any tear out, which is great. Uh, a little of the catching is just switching uh, from smaller and less efficient planes, having an uneven surface a little bit. could probably just use uh, some wax, but I also am going to end up taking the cut back some. Um, I'm going to make a full pass with the tooth plane, and then I'm going to switch to the scraper plane. And the scraper is just going to be removing the tops of the ridges that I'm leaving with the tooth plane. You could also use a card scraper, and we will use one later. You could additionally use a block plane, um, though if you're using a block plane, you need to be careful, because if you go deeper than those ridges are tall, you're going to risk tear out again. So, as I said, the first face is mostly about achieving a flat and a smooth surface, and as soon as I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and flip the plate over uh, and start working on the second face. Um, and I'll generally keep the same holes when I pin it down for the second face in the plate, but I'll drill new holes in the workboard. Um, and when I'm 
Working on the second face, I of course want to bring it flat and smooth as well, but I'm also paying attention to the thickness across the entire plate. I want to maintain that even across the entire plate um, as I bring it down. And so thinking of that, it's also important to note that when you put the plate back down, you're going to want to make sure that there's no debris underneath it, uh, because any debris underneath it is going to cause you to plane thin spots into the plate. And if you're dealing with softer wood, um, it's going to cause you potential denting issues. Um, and I'm going to be following the same pattern with the tooth plane and the scraper uh, that I was earlier, um, alternating back and forth between the two. But you'll notice um, in this section of the video that I'm going to switch to the card scraper. And the reason for that is that I'm getting closer to the final surface at this point. Um, I would do this on the first face as well. And so it's still possible to dig in deep with the scraper and mar the surface that you're working on. Um, it's a lot more likely with the scraper plane than with the card scraper. And so I feel more comfortable doing the final few passes with the card scraper. Um, you'll also notice that I am not working the entire face at this point. Uh, the reason for that is that as you bring the plate down um, towards its final thickness, you can keep it even, but you're still going to get little highs and lows in the face, um, in the plate. The, the gauge that I'm doing, that I'm using, is a dial indicator that supposedly has an accuracy of a hundredth of a millimeter. I find in practice that it's more like five hundredths of a millimeter that it's accurate to, um, but I'm still keeping things very even across the plate. And so just planing, you're, you're going to end up with, with high spots and low spots you have to deal with. And so you'll sometimes work a section, and then uh, when it's getting even, then you can go back to working the entire plate to bring it down. Um, but it's good to, to keep an eye on that as you go so you don't get, you know, to your final thickness in one spot and then find that you're a quarter of a millimeter or more off in another spot. Um, and this would, of course, be easier if I had a smaller tooth plane. Um, I do, in fact, have a second iron for my block plane that I intend at some point to tooth, but I have not gotten around to it yet. It's perfectly reasonable to do it with a large plane so long as you've made the first, uh, first face truly flat. And that would be something that even if I had a smaller plane to work with, I would want to do anyway. Um, so for now, I just make do with having the, the large plane to do all of my tooth thicknessing with. So that's about it as far as thicknessing goes. Um, I think main takeaways are to ensure you have sharp tools and a sturdy work surface um, and that you're going slowly and carefully. Um, and that will get you pretty far. It's also super helpful to have a tooth plane and I would highly suggest if you can make that happen, making it happen, uh, it'll go a long ways towards making planing more difficult and harder woods um, less stressful. Uh, scrapers are also really a wonderful addition to a guitar building shop. I find them to be invaluable. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with scrapers or if you struggle with sharpening them, you can check out the video I made about sharpening them uh, if you're interested. Thanks for watching this video today. If you like this video, um, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel. And then you can get updates when I post uh, new guitar building related videos. Uh, I'd also really appreciate it if you'd consider hitting the donate button in the description below. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to make even a low production value videos such as this and even a few dollars here or there really goes a long ways in helping me to make more of these videos in the future. Uh, in the description you'll also find a link to my website where you can check out a little more of my finished work uh, as well as seeing what I have to offer as far as one-on-one -on -one guitar building instruction goes. Um, so again thanks for watching today. Um, I hope you're doing well and hope to see you next time. Take care.